yes. so I want to represent uh, Yaroslav Malkov. Um, so he is um, he graduated actually first of all from the famous in Russia Komogorov Mathematical School, which actually collected the most talented people of the for, who uh, former Soviet Union in in math and physics. So that's a very important start. And then he uh, uh, graduated from Nizhny Novgorod uh, University uh, with bachelor uh, in science degree with uh, honors. And then he gets a master degree uh, in theoretical and mathematical physics also from Nizhny Novgorod University. And finally, he uh, gets his PhD in physics and mathematics from uh, Institute of Apply, uh, Applied Physics uh, in Nizhny Novgorod. So uh, in 19, uh, uh, what, what it was? <laughs> uh, what year it was? Uh, 2010, I think, right? 2009, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I invited him from Russia. He was a postdoc in my lab. Uh, and for two years working on my lab, we published a, a huge series of papers on uh, locomotion, and we worked together. And I still continue to operate with him many things. And uh, he finally gets uh, at, uh, uh, in mathematical department of mathematics at uh, uh, calls, uh, double Purdue uh, Indianapolis University. And uh, he is presenting uh, this work, that party, with myself. Thank you. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, like Ilya said, my name is Yaroslav Molkov. And uh, right now, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematical Sciences in the Indiana University, Purdue University, in Indianapolis. That's how it is called correctly. <laughs> so, and before I moved here, like Ilya said, I worked as a researcher in Drexel University. And with Ilya, who actually involved me in this area. And I'm, I'm going to talk about neural substrate uh, for breathing in mammals. And uh, the most basic and at the same time still heatedly debated question in this field is, how is the respiratory rhythm generated? And in my talk, I will attempt to guess why this question remains yet unanswered. So to begin with, uh, the rhythmic activity which drives breathing in mammals is generated by a special neural circuitry in the brain. And we call this structure the respiratory central pattern generator, or just CPG in short. And the role of the CPG is to produce coordinated motor outputs to the respiratory muscles. And of course, it responds to numerous afferent inputs to adjust its activity in accordance with changing environmental conditions. So the respiratory rhythm uh, generating circuits reside in the lower brainstem, more specifically in the medallion points. And the respiratory, and here is a parasagittal view of the brainstem that includes respiration related neural structures. And rhythm generating neurons are located in this area, which is called ventral respiratory column or just VRC. Okay. And if we take a look at the activity patterns of the neurons from the VRC in vivo, it turns out there is, that the respiratory rhythm is not just alternations of inspiration and expiration. Inspiratory phase is defined by the discharges of the phrenic nerve activity. And the respiratory neurons exhibit really complex behavior throughout the respiratory cycle. Some of them are most active uh, in the beginning of inspiration. And that's why we call them early eye cells. Some of them gradually increase their activity throughout the inspiration, like this ramp eye. 
But what is really important to notice is that there are two kinds of expiratory neurons. Um, the neurons of the first type are most active in the beginning of expiration, and we call them post inspiratory neurons. Uh, and the other, the neurons of the other type start being active only at the second half of expiration and have the ramping uh, activity pattern. So we call them augmenting expiratory or OGD cells. So the respiratory cycle apparently consists of three phases, inspiration and two phases of expiration, E1 or post-inspiration and E2 or late, late expiration. So among other structures of the ventral obscurity column, uh, there is a very special compartment uh, which was identified by Jeff Smith. His name, his, he named uh, this structure pre complex. And what is special about this pre complex, if we cut the slice containing uh, this structure, then such in vitro preparation is capable of generating endogenous rhythm. Moreover, it can generate ry rhythmic bursting even if all kinds of synaptic inhibition is pharmacologically blocked. Even further, if we completely decouple the network by blocking excitatory neurotransmission as well, we still can find cells that show rhythmic bursting provided by certain intrinsic cellular properties. So the pre complex is believed to be an essential part of the respiratory CPG even though this endogenous bursting does not look like normal three-phase respiratory rhythm, it was initially hypothesized that intrinsic bursting properties of pre complex cells underlie the rhythmic activity of pre complex. And this broadcasts the rhythm to the rest of the network. The opposing view, however, is that under normal conditions, pre complex is embedded in a much more intricate network, and we need more intact preparation to study it. So in my talk, uh, I, I will try a bottom-up approach to figure this out. First, we elaborate the individual cell model, then we connect cells into an excitatory population representing pre complex. And finally, we will embed pre complex model to the circuitry generating three-phase rhythm. All right. So first, let's talk about intrinsic cellular mechanisms. And intrinsic bursts and properties of individual neurons imply the existence of the additional time scale, which defines the intermittent firing and quiescence, uh, and qui quiescence uh, schematically shown by this blue curve. Mathematically, this phenomenon relies on very specific nonlinear properties that force a cell to start firing at a very high rate um, as uh, the spike of threshold is exceeded. In addition, there should be a slow negative feedback mechanism in, in, initiated by spiking that ultimately terminates the burst and then requires certain time for the cell to recover before next burst of spikes can occur. And the first mechanism found to be critically important for intrinsic bursting in the pre complex is so-called persistent sodium current. It provides, a, let me try to highlight this, it provides a negative slope uh, in a certain range of voltages on the current voltage flow. Accordingly, the depolarization of the cell membrane about the threshold leads to its abrupt activation, which can serve as a burst onset mechanism. And since the application of persistent sodium blocker, Rilozole, was found to abolish 
this rhythm in this preparation. The conclusion has been drawn that at least in this very reduced in vitro preparation of a red, the rhythmic activity on cribazine gut complex is provided by persistent sodium-based bursts synchronized by mutually excited reconnections. And this is the first bullet on our list. Okay. In a conductance-based description, like many other channels, persistent sodium is characterized by a product of voltage-dependent activation and inactivation variables. Uh, the activation is very fast and usually accepted in spontaneous, while inactivation is much slower. So on a short time scale, this current does not inactivate while the voltage is hot, and that's why it is called persistent. And it was hypothesized that slow inactivation of this same persistent sodium current serves as a burst termination and recovery mechanism. But it is worth mentioning that no unequivocal evidence if this has ever, of this has ever been found experimentally. Moreover, the mathematical analysis of, the, of this model reveals very specific bifurcation scenarios possible in this system. This picture shows maximal conductance of the persistent sodium current versus the leak reversal potential, uh, which characterizes the cell excitability. First, this bursting does not seem to be robust you can see that the range of the excitability is pretty narrow. Second, if we suppress this current by blocking a fraction of persistent sodium channels, hence decreasing the conductance, the only possible transition is to a quiescent state. In contrast, in the experiments with real of sensitive neurons, the resulting regime is a sustained spiking. Yet another principal discrepancy is concerned with the dependence of the burst frequency on real of concentration. The model predicts that it falls to zero, while in the experiments uh, it remains fairly constant. This all makes it questionable if the burst termination does rely on the persistent sodium current slow inactivation. On the other hand, the persistent sodium current is an additional source of sodium influx. To maintain intracellular sodium homeostasis, it has to activate sodium potassium exchanger, which results in the outward and hence hyperpolarizing current denoted I pump in the equation. To keep, to keep intracellular sodium concentration constant on average, this current has to be of the same order of magnitude as other sodium currents. This makes sodium pump a potent mechanism of cell activity limiter and burst termination. Intracellular sodium concentration serves as a slow variable, and its dynamics defines the interburst recovery time. So we incorporated the sodium pump to the model and compare three cases. When a burst is terminated by slow inactivation of persistent sodium, when the persistent sodium current, uh, I'm sorry, when both mechanisms operate in parallel, and when the persistent sodium current does not inactivate at all. So the pump is the only burst termination mechanism. These pictures represent a parameter plane similar to what I, I already showed before. Parameter drive, or G-tonic, defines cell excitability, and GNAP is a maximal conductance of the persistent sodium current. First of all, let's know that sodium pump, when added, significantly expands the area of bursting on this parameter plane. 
This expansion has an important implication. Radial decrease of persistent sodium conductance in most cases leads to a transition to tonic activity and not to acquiescent state. In addition, the dependence of the period of bursting on GNAP, like this, is fairly flat and not sharply increasing as in the former case. So now we have a plausible model of real result dependent bursters, which suggests that burst on set is provided by persistent sodium nonlinearity, and sodium pump is a robust mechanism for its termination and recovery. And we have to revise our first rule accordingly. But this is not the end of the story about cellular level of this system. Because in a similar prep, but taken from another species, mouse, different types of bursters have been identified. The first type is the same real result sensitive bursters as we just discussed. Interestingly, those cells were insensitive to cadmium, like this, which is a block of calcium channels. The second time, exhibited something opposite. Their bursting did not depend on persistent sodium, but could be abolished by cadmium. Similar effect had fluffinamic acid, which blocks non-specific cationic currents that depend on intracellular calcium concentration. So now we have another type of bursters that do not have much to do with persistent sodium current but rather rely on calcium dynamics. To account for this, we should include calcium influx and calcium dependent non-specific cationic inward current or CAN current in short. To maintain calcium homeostasis, we have calcium membrane pump and also calcium exchange system with endoplasmic reticulum. This system includes initial triphosphate dependent calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. These channels provide a phenomenon known as calcium induced calcium release. What happens is if calcium exceeds a certain level, it leads to a massive release of calcium from endoplasmic reticulum resulting in membrane depolarization mediated by CAN current. And high intracellular calcium concentration evokes slow deactivation of those channels, which eventually stops the calcium explosion and defines the recovery period before the next release can occur. So this mechanism is coupled to neuron firing by means of high threshold voltage dependent calcium channels. During act action potentials, calcium enters the cell and eventually intracellular calcium concentration exceeds a threshold for calcium induced calcium release. Intracellular calcium jumps up and activates chem current, which in turn excites the cell even stronger. On the other hand, this starts deactivating calcium channels on endoplasmic reticular membrane, which ultimately disrupts this positive feedback loop. Importantly, a large fraction of a CAN current is sodium ions that enter the cell during activity. This activates a sodium pump, which turns out to be a main mechanism of burst termination in calcium dependent bursting as well. So calcium influx is critically important for this to work. And we can speculate that a distinguishing feature of such bursts is relatively high conductance of voltage gated calcium channel. 
So on the cellular level, we have at least two rhythm generator mechanisms which differ by the burst on cell dependence. In some cells, the burst on set occurs due to strong persistent sodium current, and in some other cells, the burst on set is provided by calcium influx can current positive feedback. In both cases, burst termination and recovery period is provided by electrogenic sodium potassium pump and intracellular sodium dynamics. So the emerging picture is as follows. Persistent sodium-based bursting requires high enough persistent sodium conductance. And for calcium-dependent rhythm, a cell should have strong enough calcium channels. Let's consider a population of cells with uniformly distributed conductances of persistent sodium and calcium currents. It is convenient to map each cell to a parameter plane like this. Y-axis is for calcium conductance, and X-axis represents a ratio of persistent sodium conductance over the leak conductance. Lower right corner of this rectangle contains cells with strong persistent sodium and weak calcium current. So they are capable of persistent sodium dependent bursting, which is indifferent to cadmium. Similarly, in the upper left corner, cells have strong calcium influx and weak persistent sodium current. So they exhibit calcium dependent bursting insensitive to real as well. In upper right corner, neurons have both strong persistent sodium and calcium currents. So one should apply both cadmium and real to shut them down. And finally, the lower left corner represents cells incapable of bursting whatsoever. And now we are going to connect all the cells by mutual excitatory connections. We have two seemingly independent bursting mechanisms, persistent sodium-based and chem current-based. So we want to figure out conditions when one or another is more important. In an excitatory network, each cell has an additional source of depolarization provided by the synaptic conductance, which depends on inputs from other cells. If they are all to all connected, the synaptic conductance is proportional to the number of neurons and to the number of synapses that a source neuron makes on a target neuron on average. Hence, for this simple network architecture, we need just one aggregate parameter to characterize the strength of the synaptic interactions, a product of number of neurons n and the average synaptic weight w. As a second control parameter, we choose a baseline synaptic conductance, g tonic to characterize the overall excitability of the network. First of all, in order to achieve synchronous discharges in such a heterogeneous population, the connection, connections should be sufficiently strong. If we choose NW just enough for that, at re relative, relatively low tonic drive, The, rhythm, uh, the rhythmic activity in the network can be totally abolished by suppressing the persistent sodium current. Even though realizable and sensitive cells still exhibit some residual activity. I mean this too. However, with stronger connections and or great number of neurons, one can observe something different. Right here, we increased n times w from 2 to 5 nanosiemens. Now, the blockade of persistent sodium alone does not lead to the rhythm cessation. But if we also block concurrent, the activity in the network is totally gone. 
The most amazing thing is if we increase the excitability from 0.4 to 0.5 nanosiemens with the same connections. The rhythm persists even after both persistent sodium and chem current are fully blocked. Okay, let's take a look at the parameter plane synaptic strength versus excitability. The entire multicolor region is an area of bursting with persistent sodium and cam current uh, mechanisms present. If you block the persistent sodium, the area shrinks a little on the left boundary, losing this blue part. If we block chem current in addition, the area shrinks a little bit further by this green part. But what remains is this huge gray region where the existence of the bursting does not depend on any intrinsic bursting properties of the cells. And mathematical analysis shows that the burst on set mechanism on this model primarily relies on the recurrent synaptic excitation while persistent sodium and CAN mechanisms just modulate network excitability rather than define its rhythmicity. And burst termination and recovery is provided by a sodium pump. So on the population level, the reef relies on excited synaptic interaction based mechanism, which alone provides necessary nonlinearity regardless of intrinsic properties of the cells comprising the population. Persistent sodium and chem currents do modulate the excitability of the cell, and that may explain the controversial results obtained in different preparations. Okay, unfortunately, endogenous rhythm generated by isolated prebazinga complex does not explain a zoo of different activity patterns observed in vivo. So we need to embed it to, to the intact respiratory network. And for that, we're going to use an uh, arterially perfused preparation of the intact brainstem invented by Julian Payton. It allows for simultaneous recording of several motor outputs. And in addition, due to incredible mechanical stability of this prep, one can take intracellular recordings from the respiratory neurons. And to explore the organization of the respiratory CPG, Jeff Smith and his collaborators did a very elegant experiment. They sequentially transected the brainstem starting from pontomedullary junction while recording from respiratory nerves to see what happens to their activity patterns. In the intact preparation, phrenic nerve activity has uh, a ramping pattern during inspiration. Hypoglossal nerve discharge starts just before inspiration. And importantly, central vagus nerve shows very pronounced post component. If we cut the pons, what happens is central vagus loses this post eye component completely. All nerves start discharging synchronously, and phrenic nerve is no longer empty. If we cut everything but privates in the complex, the activity of all nerves become, becomes very similar to what we saw in a slice preparation containing just privates in the complex. The discharges in all nerves have very similar decrementing patterns. In addition to motor outputs, they recorded single unit activities from different compartments of the ventral respiratory column. They classified the cells in accordance with their foreign patterns and calculated spike histograms of the resulting population. And here is how they look like. In the intact prep, in Bandinga complex, they found mostly expiratory neurons of two types, post-I and OG-E. 
And pre-Bazunga complex contained mostly in spiritual neurons of different pathways. And after pontomidallary transaction, the most striking difference is that the activity patterns of all neurons become very similar. They can be divided just into inspiratory and expiratory neurons with decrementing pattern of activity. And in this case, we don't have two distinct phases of expiration. That's why we call this regime two-phase rhythm. Finally, if we cut buds in the complex as well, we lose all expiratory cells. All we have is sort of inspiratory activity endogenously generated by the cytotron network in the pre bazinga complex. That's why we call this regime one phase rhythm. Based on these experimental findings, Ilya Rybuk suggested a rel relatively simple neural circuitry that explains all these transformations. Populations in the ventral respiratory group are responsible for the motor pattern formation. And the four populations in Badzinga and pre Badzinga complexes comprise a core of the respiratory circuitry. The three phase pattern is provided by the inhibitory ring consisting of post I, AUG E, and early I population. Pre II represents the excitatory population of pre the complex that we discussed before. The decrementing patterns of post-I and early-I populations are provided by some intrinsic firing frequency adaptation mechanism, and augmenting pattern of OG-E is due to post-I disinhibition. The key hypothesis of this model was that post I neurons in Badzinger complex receive a strong tonic drive from pons. If we cut the pons, pontin drive disappears, post I population in the Badzinger complex shuts down, and that's why central vagus nerve loses its post I component. Let me show you the model simulations mimicking the transaction experiments. In the intact case, all four populations are functioning. Due to frequency adaptation properties, early I and post I populations form a half center oscillate. At the transition from inspiration to expiration, post I population activates. Then it adapts and gradually increases from inhibition of endurance that activate at the second half of expiration. That's how we have two phases of expiration. And due to post-I adaptation, the inspiratory neurons are also getting disinhibited. Eventually they escape and immediately inhibit both expiratory populations. After cutting the pons, the drive to post I population disappears and it gets completely silenced. Accordingly, post I component is no longer present in central vagus nerve activity. Our, our core circuitry gets reduced to three populations like this. We don't see OG E activity in Bazinga complex because OG E neurons change their pattern to decrement. Like I said, these oscillations are called two phase rhythm, for we don't have two distinct phases of expiration anymore. If we cut also buds in the complex, the only functioning population that remains is excited to pre I in pre the complex. It generates endogenous bursting based on the recurrent excitation, as we discussed. We don't have any expiratory activity in this regime whatsoever, 
so we call it one phase read. And John Rubin with collaborators performed a very thorough mathematical analysis of this model. And here is their, their conclusions about oscillatory mechanisms operating in two other states. In the intact medulla, they have two inhibitory populations, OG E and early R, and both with adaptive properties. And due to reciprocal inhibition, they form a half-center oscillator, which is capable of generating its own rhythm. And pre ii receives a strong drive and cannot deactivate on its own. So the transitions from inspiration to expiration and back are governed by different mechanisms in this circuitry. The expiratory neurons adapt and release inspiratory ones. At certain point, pre ii escapes, excites early I, which in turn shuts OB e down. Then early I starts adapting during inspiration, releasing OB e which eventually activates and triggers excitation, expiration, I'm sorry. In the intact quantum medullary network, the difference is that post I population is stronger than OG E. So the main interplay happens between post I and early I populations that together control OG E activity. OG E inhibits early eye stronger than it does, it inhibits pre eye eye. So as post eye adapts, pre eye eye escapes first and excites early eye, which activates with a little, with a slight. So to summarize, in the partly or fully intact respiratory networks, the transitions between respiratory phases are governed by different mechanisms. Our old friend excited tree population of free in the complex entrains their own set of inspiration, while the offset is provided by a network mechanism based on the reciprocal inhibition. Interestingly, even if we eliminate endogenous rhythmogenic properties in the free in the complex, by for instance removing its recurrent excitatory connection. This system will still be able to generate the rhythm based on its half-center properties. Although in fully intact network, pre ii escape seems to be important for hypoglossal and phrenic motor output coordination. But this is also not the end of the story because the respiratory CPG under certain metabolic conditions provides one more motor output that does not appear to originate in any of the mentioned populations. The point is that under normal conditions, we don't engage our abdominal muscles for breathing. Inspiration is provided by diaphragm controlled by phrenic nerve activity. And expiration occurs passively. This is evident from the absence of significant activity in the abdominal nerve. But if we increase the level of carbon dioxide, then the large amplitude discharges start appearing in the abdominal nerve activity. Interestingly, at relatively low levels of CO2, these discharges are quite rare but they occur at strictly defined phase of the respiratory cycle, late expiration. With an increase in CO2, their appearance becomes more and more frequent, like three to one, then two to one, until it reaches one to one coupling with phrenic nerve discharges. We call this stepwise increase in the frequency of late e bursts a quantal acceleration of abdominal activity. You can see this stair-like um, decrease in the interburst periods of the abdominal discharges as CO2 concentration progressively increases. 
And this scenario is reversed by restoring CO2 to, I'm sorry, to a normal level. And at the end of this experiment, we set 10% CO2 and then applied Relozole, which totally abolished abdominal discharges right here. So the late E activity in the abdominal nerve critically depends on persistent sodium mechanism. The source of abdominal late expiratory activity resides within a structure called retrotrapezoid nucleus, which is a main site of central chemoreception in the brain. It contains a compartment called parafacial respiratory group, which was found to have endogenous rhythmic capabilities independent of prebasing the camp. This gave rise to so-called dual generator concept. It postulates that the respiratory motor outputs are generated by two interaction oscillators. The inspiratory phrenic nerve activity originates in prebasal complex, and expiratory abdominal activity comes from RTM PFRG. And on the baseline CO2 level, only our main CPG operates. But on the hypercapnia, the endogenously uh, rhythmic population activates in the RTN and provides an output to the abdominal nerve. As we saw, the rhythmogenic capabilities of this population critically depend on the persistent sodium current since its activity can be fully abolished by relusol. And this late E population receives input from RTM central chemoreceptors. That is why progressive increase in CO2 makes it more and more excitable. And the firing pattern of this late E population is controlled by inhibitor projections from post I and early I neurons of the core CPG. Normally, this inhibition prevents late E population from activation. But with increased CO2, it, it becomes capable of escaping when the inhibition is minimal throughout the respiratory cycle. That is, at the, at the very end of expiration. The late E neurons also entrain neurons of the core CPG which affects the coordination of other motor outputs as well. And here is an illustration of quantal acceleration phenomenon as simulated by the model. At low CO2 levels, the excitability of late E population is low, and it requires long recovery before the next escape occurs, and the next abdominal burst is generated. As the drive from central chemoreceptors increases, this recovery period becomes shorter and shorter, and abdominal interverse interval decreases in a stepwise manner. So unlike pre-I population in the intact network, late E neurons are much less excitable even under strong hypercapnia. This is consistent with the fact that their burst and properties fully rely on the presence of persistent sodium carb. And the mechanisms of phase transitions become much more complicated in the extensive network. First, late E escapes from post-I inhibition at the end of expiration and it entrains pre-I-I, which immediately activates but it also additionally excites already active AUG-E neurons who prevent early eye population from immediate activation. At some point, late, late E starts deactivating 
which weakens out E and finally lets early eye jump up and initiate inspiration. Interestingly, in the extended network, the rhythmogenic properties of prebasinal complex become even less important because its activation depends on late E oscillator. So the escape of pre complex does not define the onset of inspiration anymore. So what seemed to be a clue in the beginning of our bottom-up construction got almost entirely devalued in the end. So what generates the refugee rhythm? And it really depends. And I have already mentioned my collaborators. That's basically all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaroslav. That was great. Um, do, do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Um, yeah, I only have a comment that that was great. <laughs> is sort of the take-home message that the system is just robust, is built that way because to be robust under so many different physiological conditions, is that? Uh, not only physiological, but also kind of pathological. Yeah. So even if you cut the system, I mean, if you reduce it to so great extent, it's still, it is still doing something, but uh, it's really hard to believe that what it is doing in the reduced case is just the same regime as, as we see in like normal conditions. So that's why I think people are so much confused by the results of in, in preparations that are reduced to different extents. Yeah. I mean, it, it Another comment I have is sort of reminds me of back in, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, people looking at very simple pattern generators and the argument, is it intrinsic bursting, is it network properties? And the answer always was both, I think. <laughs> is that, um, I don't yeah. know if I lost track of the CPG field entirely, but I assume that's still the case, right? Yes, it is. So I mean, it, it can be. Actually, it can be important for the phase control. I mean, if you if you want to control the duration of different phases, you have to rely on a particular on particular mechanisms, and this breaks if you if you break the system. So it still works, but it works no good. <laughs> uh, well, thank you again, Yaroslav and Ilya, for bringing him to this webinar.